Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Synthes Corporation announces fiscal 2024 fourth quarter and full year results. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the meeting over to Mr. Jared Mattingly, Vice President and Treasurer, Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Ross. Thank you for joining us. With me is Todd Schneider, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Mike Hansen, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. We will discuss our fiscal 24 fourth quarter and full year results. After our commentary, we will open the call to questions from analysts. Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995 provides a safe harbor from civil litigation for forward-looking statements. This conference call contains forward-looking statements that reflect the company's current views as to future events and financial performance. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, which could cause actual results to differ materially from those we may discuss. I refer you to the discussion on these points contained in our most recent filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. I'll now turn the call over to Todd. Thank you, Jared. Our fourth quarter performance marked a strong finish to another successful year for CentOS. Fourth quarter total revenue grew 8.2% to $2.47 billion, an all-time high for revenue in a quarter. The organic growth rate, which adjusts for the impacts of acquisitions and foreign currency exchange rate fluctuations, was 7.5%. And importantly, each of our businesses continue to perform well and execute at a high level. Fourth quarter gross margin was $1.22 billion, an increase of 11.6% over the prior year. Gross margin increased 150 basis points from 47.7% to 49.2%. Operating income for the fourth quarter of $547.6 million increased 16.3% over the prior year. Operating margin increased 160 basis points to 22.2% from 20.6% in the prior year. Fourth quarter net income was $414.3 million, an increase of 19.7%. Earnings per diluted share for the fourth quarter were $3.99, an increase of 19.8% over the prior year fourth quarter. These results conclude a strong fiscal year marked by significant accomplishments, including robust revenue growth and margin expansion and excellent cash generation, which continue to fuel our balanced capital allocation strategy. The following are specific highlights of fiscal 24. I'd like to begin with revenue. Fiscal year revenue was a record $9.6 billion an increase of 8.9%. Organic growth was 8% for the year. Our first aid and safety services operating segment exceeded $1 billion in annual revenue for the first time. Our top line growth is a function of the total value proposition we offer customers of all sizes and across industries, and the unique CentOS culture that drives our partners to deliver an outstanding customer experience. Business across our focus verticals of healthcare, hospitality, education, and state and local government continue to perform well. We experience strong demand for our services not only from existing customers, but across our new business pipeline. About two thirds of our new customers continue to come from no programmers, underscoring our ability to capitalize on the vast growth opportunity that remains ahead. In addition, our our retention rates remain strong. Our strong revenue performance also translated into continued growth in profits and earnings, including the following highlights. Fiscal 24 operating income grew 14.8% for the year, and our operating margin of 21.6% was an all-time high. EPS grew 16.6% for the year. Our enhanced profitability and earnings growth is a reflection of our relentless focus on operational excellence in every aspect of our business spanning strategic sourcing and supply chain initiatives, route and energy optimization opportunities with Smart Truck, and leveraging the SAP system to support greater stockroom visibility and efficient garment sharing. Our cash flow from operating activities exceeded $2 billion for the first time. Strong cash generation provides us even greater flexibility to deploy capital across each of our capital allocation priorities throughout the year. 
Our number one capital allocation priority is investing back in the business. We prioritize investments in technology, infrastructure, and people to support, to support our sustained growth and value creation over the long term. As we continue to grow and create value, capital is required to add capacity in a number of ways, including new facilities, new equipment, new vehicles, as well as technologies to make our partners more successful. We spent $186.8 million in fiscal 24 on acquisitions. This is the most we've spent on acquisitions since fiscal 17. We love acquisitions as they provide us with new customers where we can offer a broader range of products and services. Sometimes they can bring needed capacity. They can also bring attractive synergies that involve leveraging our existing route structures, providing more time with customers and less time driving. Another of our priorities is returning capital to our shareholders through dividends and share buybacks. In fiscal 24, we increased our quarterly per share dividend by 17.4%, marking the 40th consecutive year that we've increased our dividend, including every year since going public. We also, we also bought back $1 billion of shares during fiscal 24 and up through yesterday. Lastly, we were named to the prestigious Fortune 500 for the eighth consecutive year. It is an honor to be recognized among the most successful and respected companies. We're proud of, of these results and the value we continue to deliver for the CentOS shareholders. That performance reflects the focus and great execution by our employees, whom we call partners. I'll now turn the call over to Mike to provide details of our fourth quarter results. Thanks, Todd, and good morning. <clears throat> our fiscal 24 fourth quarter revenue was $2.47 billion compared to $2.28 billion last year. The organic revenue growth rate adjusted for acquisitions and foreign currency exchange rate fluctuations was 7.5%. Gross margin for the fourth quarter of fiscal 24 was $1.22 billion compared to $1.09 billion last year, an increase of 11.6%. Gross margin as a percent of revenue was 49.2% for the fourth quarter of fiscal 24, compared to 47.7% last year, an increase of 150 basis points. Strong growth from new customers and the penetration of existing customers with more products and services helped generate great operating leverage, aided by the performance of our global supply chain and focused efforts to extract inefficiencies from the business via our Six Sigma and engineering teams, as well as technologies like Smart Truck. The Uniform Rental and Facility Services operating segment revenue for the fourth quarter of fiscal 24 was $1.91 billion, compared to $1.77 billion last year. The organic revenue growth rate was 7.1%. As we have done in the past, I will share revenue mix of the Uniform Rental and Facility Services operating segment for the fourth quarter. Keep in mind, there can be small fluctuations in mix between quarters. Uniform Rental was 48%, Dust was 19%, Hygiene was 16%, Shop Towels were 4%, Linen, which includes microfiber, wipes, towels, and aprons, was 10%, and catalog revenue was 3%. These percentages are consistent with last year and demonstrate we are experiencing strong demand across all our products and services. Gross margin for the uniform rental and facility services operating segment was 48.6% compared to 47.7% last year. This 90 basis point improvement was the result of good top line growth that continued to generate great operating leverage and excellent sourcing and process improvements, which continue to create additional efficiencies, such as garment sharing and smart truck. Our first aid and safety services operating segment revenue for the fourth quarter was $277.6 million, compared to $249.8 million last year. The organic revenue growth rate was 11.1%, capping off another year of double-digit organic growth. Gross margin for the first, first aid and safety services operating segment was 55.4% compared to 51% last year. This 440 basis point improvement was the result of our double-digit revenue growth that created solid, solid operating leverage 
an improved sales mix, a dedicated first aid distribution center that has lowered costs, as well as efficiencies from our smart truck technology. Our fire protection services and uniform direct sale businesses are reported in the all other segment. All other revenue was $282.1 million compared to $261.5 million last year. The fire protection revenue was $197.9 million and the organic revenue growth rate was 12.9%, resulting in another year of double digit organic growth. The uniform direct sale revenue was $84.2 million and organic revenue decreased 4.4%. The organic growth rate in uniform direct sales can vary from quarter to quarter. Gross margin for fire protection services was an all-time high of 50% compared to 47.9% last year. This 210 basis point improvement was primarily the result of robust revenue growth that generated strong operating leverage along with route productivity improvements. Gross margin for uniform direct sales was 40.9% compared to 36% last year. This 490 basis point improvement was the result of higher margin accounts from a disciplined approach to the market. Fourth quarter selling and administrative expenses as a percent of revenue was 27%, which was a 10 basis point improvement from last year. We were able to create leverage with these costs while continuing to invest in technology and selling resources. Fourth quarter operating income was $547.6 million compared to $470.8 million last year. Operating income as a percentage of revenue was 22.2% in the fourth quarter of fiscal 24, compared to 20.6% in last year's fourth quarter. The fourth quarter marks the first time that all three operating segments, uniform rental and facility services, first aid and safety services, and fire protection services, exceeded 22% in operating income in the same quarter. Our effective tax rate for the fourth quarter was 21.4% compared to 22.4% last year. Net income for the fourth quarter was $414.3 million compared to $346.2 million last year. This year's fourth quarter diluted EPS was $3.99 compared to $3.33 last year, an increase of 19.8%. I'll now turn the call back over to Todd to provide his thoughts on next year and our financial expectations for fiscal 25. Thank you, Mike. As we move into fiscal 25, we expect to exceed $10 billion in annual revenue for the first time. This outlook, coupled with our strong fiscal 24 results, demonstrate that our value proposition continues to resonate. Every business in North America, goods producing or services providing, has a need for image, safety, cleanliness, and compliance. We help our customers meet those needs so they can focus on running their businesses. As we deliver on our customers' needs, our culture remains our greatest competitive advantage, and it drives our focus on continuous improvement and evolving for the future. We will continue to prioritize investments in technology, infrastructure, and people. Our technology investments include our continued investment in SAP, with our fire division currently going through the implementation process. In addition to SAP, we have partnered with Verizon and Google to deploy technology solutions that make, uh, that make it easier for our partners to run their business and easier for our customers to do business with us. In addition, technology initiatives such as smart truck and garment sharing, are helping to drive customer satisfaction as well as efficiencies throughout the organization. Our working partners really are the key to our success. We know that when we take care of our partners, they will in turn take great care of our customers. We are investing in training our partners and giving them the best and latest tools to make their jobs easier, while also investing in talent acquisition in order to ensure we are properly staffed to support our growth initiatives. The future of CentOS remains bright, and our Fiscal 25 guidance reflects that outlook. For our Fiscal 25, we expect our revenue to be in the range of $10.16 billion to $10.31 billion, a total growth rate of 5.9% to 7.4%. Please note the following. 
Physical 25 will have two fewer work days compared to Physical 24. Each quarter of Physical 25 will have 65 work days. The two fewer work days will impact the first and fourth quarters by one day each. The revenue growth rate in each of those two quarters will be negatively affected by about 160 basis points. Please keep that in mind when modeling. Adjusting for the impact of two fewer work days, acquisitions already completed, and a constant currency, our total organic growth rate for next year is expected to be 6.4% to 8%. We expect diluted EPS to be in the range of $16.25 to $16.75, a growth rate of 7.3% to 10.6%. Fiscal 25 net interest expense is expected to be approximately $106 million compared to $95 million in fiscal 24, predominantly as a result of higher variable rate debt used to complete a portion of the previously mentioned share buybacks. Our fiscal 25 effective tax rate is expected to be 20.4%, the same compared to our fiscal 24. Guidance, guidance does not include any future share buybacks or significant economic disruptions or downturns. I want to end by thanking our partners for their tremendous efforts to achieve a successful fiscal 24. As we look ahead to fiscal 25, our outlook reflects our continued confidence in our strategy. We remain focused on delivering outstanding customer experiences, reinforcing the unique CentOS culture that drives our success while making the necessary investments in the business to sustain our growth through fiscal 25 and long beyond. I'll now turn the call back over to Jared. That concludes our prepared remarks. Now we are happy to answer questions from the analysts. Please ask just one question and a single follow-up if needed. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad now. Please be, pre be, please be prepared to ask your question when prompted. You will also be allowed to ask one follow-up question. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your phone now. And our first question comes from Joshua Chan from UBS. Please go ahead, Joshua. Hi, good morning, Todd, Mike, and Jared. Uh, congratulations on a strong quarter. Um, I was wondering if you guys could comment on your retention rates. I, I know that you've said it's generally stable. Have you seen any slight uptick in industry churn or um, you know, downtick in retention, I guess? Or how, how are you seeing your customers behave in, in this environment? Uh, good morning, Josh, uh, and thanks for your comments. Um, we really haven't seen a change in our customer behavior. Um, our, as I mentioned, our retention rates are still at, at very attractive levels. Uh, and, and when you have as broad of a, um, a customer base as we do, there are certainly some aspects that are doing uh, that are thriving and some that are struggling. It, it varies based upon industry and varies based upon geography. Uh, but uh, when you speak as a whole, um, uh, I would say our, our customer base is, um, has, uh, we haven't seen much change in it so far. That's great to hear. And then uh, for my follow-up, could you just kind of talk about your, your reasoning behind choosing the 6.4 to 8.0% organic growth for next year? I guess in the context of just doing 7.5% in Q4, what, what are the scenarios that would lead you to the bottom and the top ends of the growth range? And thank you so much. Uh, well, Josh, you know, um, uh, we really like our, uh, uh, where we're gu our guide is. We like where our business is. Um, and um, uh, that's, that's where we, um, that's kind of where we target our business to, uh, to grow at those types of levels. Um, uh, certainly, um, uh, you know, we, we read, uh, uh, you know, the, the overall macro data that, we, that, that you all read about what's going on in the economy. And we're so we we watch that, um, uh, but we uh, we don't expect much change uh, at this point. And as a result, I'd say we expect to be right in uh, in that guide. Um, uh, we'd love for the economy to to, uh, to go even faster. Um, uh, and uh, but but nevertheless, um, we find ways to be successful. Our 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 value proposition is resonating. Um, you know, we have, uh, we service uh, a little over a million customers. There's 16 million businesses uh, in, our, in our market, um, uh, and we have all kinds of ways to grow. 
Uh, and I think we've shown that, that we have the ability to uh, exceed uh, GDP growth and exceed uh, uh, employment growth. So um, uh, we would certainly love for our customers to be uh, uh, thriving and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and adding people um, uh, uh, all over the place. Uh, but nevertheless, we're going to find a way to be successful, and we're, uh, we're confident in our, uh, in our guide. And our next question comes from Heather Balski from Bank of America. Please go ahead, Heather. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, can you just kind of update us on how you're thinking about incremental margins and, and how you're thinking about the margin story for 2025? You know, what are the, the bigger tailwinds? What are you most excited about? Um, and, and, and anything going on in the cost environment as well. Thank you. Well, I'll start, Heather. Um, good morning. Um, you know, um, uh, as we think about margin expansion, and uh, uh, our, our guide uh, uh, reflects margin expansion, um, uh, with the first item we think about as it comes to that is um, leverage, leverage on um, revenue growth. And, um, uh, and we've, we've demonstrated that we have the ability to do that and uh, we'll continue to do that. Um, and uh, that's uh, easy to say, hard to do, but, uh, but the team has done an incredible job uh, in so many areas, starting with our global supply chain, uh, which is a competitive advantage in the marketplace, um, uh, how they go about their jobs, uh, uh, you know, uh, the fact that they have uh, uh, dual source or many sources for 90% or more of the products that we source, um, uh, so how they go about that, the, the great work that's been done on material cost, um, uh, you know, uh, so again, starting with sourcing, but also, um, you know, uh, we, we leverage our SAP system to help us uh, to, uh, to improve our garment sharing, uh, and we've been working on this for years, uh, and it's, um, and it's, uh, it's bearing fruit uh, not only in our cost structure, uh, but also uh, in turnaround time for our customers. Uh, so it helps us to get product to our customers faster when it's in our stock rooms versus having to order uh, new out of our distribution centers. Uh, better for our customers, uh, better for our, uh, our financials, um, and, uh, uh, and that's paying off for us. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our next question comes from Andy Whitman from RW Baird. Please go ahead, Andy. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, uh, and good morning. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, guys, I just thought I would start with the competitive environment. Um, both of your largest competitors have noted uh, increased competition out there, and I know that your product and, and service offering is a little bit broader, but I thought just given those uh, competitor comments, I would uh, take your temperature and have you comment, if you could, please, on what you're seeing out there in the, com in the competitive environment. Uh, good morning, Andy. Um, uh, here's what I'll tell you is that uh, we operate in a highly competitive market. Um, always have, always will. I'm sure uh, I've been with the company for 35 years. Um, it's been competitive every day since I've been here. Um, our, now, that being said, our revenue retention rates, as I mentioned, are attractive. Um, and part of it is because, um, you know, our new business wins tend to come from the no program market uh, and less from uh, the competition. So, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's 16 million businesses out there. We service about a million. Um, so, the white space out there is incredible, um, uh, and, uh, and we're uh, focused on um, converting those folks from, a, I'll call it a do-it-yourself type, uh, to, um, uh, to a customer of ours. And that, that value proposition is resonating because uh, we help them focus on uh, taking their care of their customers or their patients or their guests or whatever, uh, however you want to describe it, um, and we, we take that for them. And um, we're able to do it better, uh, faster, smarter, and in many cases cheaper than what they were doing it. So, um, yeah, it's, is it competitive? Heck yeah, it's always been competitive, and, uh, um, uh, and we're focused on uh, growing the market, and, um, and that's, uh, that's been a good model for us. Appreciate that. Uh, and then I guess uh, maybe, Mike, I, I guess I wanted to kind of ask uh, some of the margin questions a little bit different way. Um, first, you know, as I was just kind of doing the math between the EPS and the revenue, 
I was getting somewhere around 20 or 30 basis points of implied operating margin expansion for the year. So maybe you could just give clarify that. But but that's a, a pretty decent deceleration from the amount of margin expansion certainly saw in the quarter or even over the course of the, of the past fiscal year. So I was just wondering um, if you could comment on if there's anything, any categories inside the P&L uh, that we should be aware of uh, that are inflating uh, more materially, or if there's other um, areas, maybe energy costs, I don't know, that, that we should be aware of uh, that could be weighing on um, continued margin expansion like we've seen here in recent quarters. Thanks. Uh, Andy, we, uh, uh, the, the short answer to are, are there any uh, new headwinds, um, uh, the short answer is uh, no, uh, with the exception of maybe the, uh, the two fewer workdays. Uh, where, where as, you, as, as you've heard us talk about, um, for example, in the first quarter, um, uh, we've talked a little bit about the top line uh, impact being 160 basis points of growth um, uh, headwind. Uh, but also, you know, you've also heard us talk about margins um, when we lose a work day. Uh, we've generally talked about a 50 basis point impact. We lose two work days next year. Uh, we've done such a good job of leveraging our infrastructure that the, the loss of a workday in a quarter is probably more like 30 to 40 basis points now. Uh, but we lose two workdays, and so there will be a little bit of, uh, of headwind uh, from that that is just sort of uh, a, a product of the calendar and not necessarily the business. Having said that, the business is still operating really well, and if you think about the – we think about the guidance range is generally in the – you know, you can call it the 25 to 35 uh, percent incremental margin range. Uh, and so it, it is a pretty good margin range, the 30 basis points that you uh, 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 referred to, Andy. We would, we would kind of say, look, at the very bottom, there still is margin expansion at the very bottom of our range. At the top of the range, there's, uh, there's more than 30 basis points, probably more like 70 basis points. Um, so uh, the year – we think is that this is a typical guide range for us. Um, uh, as you saw in our fourth quarter, the, the uh, initiatives and the operational excellence that we have worked so hard on have continued in the fourth quarter. And, and given this guide, we expect those to uh, continue into fiscal 25. And our next question comes from George Tong from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead, George. Hi, thanks. Good morning. Uh, can you talk a bit about the progress you're making with penetrating your high growth focus verticals, including healthcare, hospitality, education, and government? Where are you seeing uh, particularly good traction? Uh, good morning, George. Um, yeah, we, we really uh, like the verticals that we've chosen. Um, uh, and, uh, and as a reminder, uh, it's not just a sales strategy. Um, it, it is also um, how we uh, organize around those customers, uh, those industries, those verticals, uh, to make sure that we're um, uh, meeting, exceeding their needs, because um, they're, they're a little different. And, um, and as we do that, uh, the products, the services that we provide, uh, the support that we provide is all um, comes along with that. And uh, so, yeah, they're, they're all uh, operating at attractive levels, and um, uh, I wouldn't call anyone out specifically where I'd say, oh, my gosh, that one's, you know, exceeding. Um, uh, they're all, they're all uh, doing quite well. Um, I thought it might be helpful um, I, uh, to uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, a recent healthcare win that we had. Um, you know, uh, we recently sold a, a large hospital network with, with scrub dispensing technology, uh, for the scrubs in the various departments uh, throughout uh, um, a, uh, an acute care hospital. Uh, but we're also having really good success with uh, surgery centers and those types that are attached to the large acute care hospital networks. And you're probably seeing some of that uh, uh, acute care hospital networks uh, having uh, investments in other areas. So, you know, uh, in fact, I'd say three large healthcare systems uh, came to us for help uh, uh, with their, their non-acute facilities. When I say non-acute facilities, I'm talking about really surgery centers, clinics, physician offices, those types. Uh, and they came to us and said, uh, you're doing a great job for our acute care. Can you help us with the non-acute? Um, 
And, and what does that do for them? It allows them to have a consistent uh, supply, uh, but also allows them to consolidate vendors. Um, so um, uh, we're seeing good success in, uh, in certainly in healthcare, uh, but the other verticals are, uh, are all performing well, and um, we like the, uh, uh, the decisions, the investments that we've made in those areas, and we think they're going to continue to pay uh, dividends for us. Got it. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Tim Mulrooney from William Blair. Please go ahead, Tim. Yeah. Uh, good morning, uh, Mike Todd. Just uh, just one from me, and I, I hopped on late, so apologies if this has been addressed. But a few of your competitors have have, have recently cited you know, more more pricing pushback, and uh, you know an increasing number of customers putting their their contracts out to bid. I'm I'm wondering on this pricing idea. You know, if you're seeing a similar dynamic where customers are becoming more price sensitive in this environment, or do you think that's this is less of an issue, you know, for the industry overall, and, and could perhaps be more specific to these individual companies or markets. Uh, good morning, Tim. So uh, I, I'd say uh, nothing to call out specifically there. It's still really a normal operating involve, uh, operating environment. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we operate in a highly competitive market. Um, so um, you know, we've got to uh, we've got to uh, make sure that we're our value proposition is resonating with our customers and we're providing outstanding customer service. Uh, we've said that our plan is, is to lower pricing back towards uh, uh, historical levels, and, and that's what we're seeing. Um, and I would just point out that uh, as we've moderated pricing, even in fiscal 24, we were able to expand operating margins, 120 basis points. Um, uh, and uh, so we're finding ways to, uh, to provide great value for our customers while moderating pricing and um, uh, but still extracting inefficiencies out of our business so that we can uh, improve uh, um, uh, operating margins. Okay, so not really seeing pushback uh, on on pricing. And, and Todd, would you say uh, it certainly is not lost on us that you had strong incrementals this quarter? Um, um, you know, as pricing moderated, would you would you say now pricing has fully normalized that that there is no more headwind as we head into 2025 from for moderating pricing or is that are you still in that process oh uh tim we've uh, as i mentioned it's a highly competitive market we have uh, continued to moderate uh, pricing uh and uh and uh, you know pricing is a local subject um it, it really depends upon the customers what uh, what their operating environment's like um what their customer base is doing those types. So uh, we continue to monitor that and uh, and manage it appropriately based upon uh, our local businesses and uh, um, uh, and making sure that we're uh, meeting our customers' needs and thinking about the long-term value of a customer um, because we don't we don't look at it and say you know we're we're we're, uh, we're focused on uh, the near term or the short term. Uh, we're focused on the long term for our customers and we'll continue to. Uh, to manage pricing in uh, in that manner, and, and I might just add, uh, Tim, to to your question. Um, probably not a lot of fiscal 25 to fiscal 24 year over year pricing change. And our next question comes from Andrew Steinerman from J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead, Andrew. Hey, um, if you could believe it, I'm just going to ask you to clarify something you, you, you just said. So you talked about moderating pricing. When, when I hear the words moderating pricing, I hear price decreases. I, I assume what you mean is you're moderating to a more normal um, type of modest price increase. And then when talking about fiscal 25, are you talking about modest price increases or really flat pricing year over year for existing customers? Uh, well, good morning, Andrew. Uh, and just to clarify, um, moderating pricing is the way you characterize it, which is uh, um, we are uh, passing through uh, modest price increases uh, based upon uh, our uh, agreement and relationship with that customer. Uh, and that varies based upon customers, geographies, industries, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the way you described it is appropriate. It's a modest price increase. Um, uh, in, with customers uh, in, in general. Mm -hmm. 
And that's true for the fiscal 25 too, right? Uh, that, that would be correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Good clarification. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Jasper Bibb from Truist Securities. Please go ahead, Jasper. Hey, good morning, guys. I um, was hoping you could give a bit more color on what you're seeing as far as net headcount of customers or their hiring posture and any expectations there embedded in your fiscal 25 organic growth guidance. Uh, good morning, Jasper. Uh, yeah, it really varies. Um, as I mentioned, we have such a broad customer base uh, in geographies, um, but uh, really not much change in customer behavior when it comes to um, um, uh, hiring. Um, you know, uh, uh, we're seeing a, a pretty, um, uh, the environment is, is uh, I'll call it stable, and, uh, and hasn't, uh, hasn't really changed much um, in, the, in the past uh, uh, few quarters. Got it. Um, last one for me. Maybe asking an earlier question a little bit differently. With this whole dynamic of peers talking about increased churn, including at some of their larger national accounts, if you're not seeing a pricing or retention hit, are you potentially taking away some of this competitor business at a higher rate, given these market dynamics? Uh, well, here's where I would describe it: is we're um, uh, we operate in a really competitive environment, and um, so we're, uh, uh, we're out there um, uh, trying to do the best to take care of our customers, fighting for business every day. Um, and, um, uh, and I wouldn't characterize it as really much of a change in the environment. Uh, it's always really competitive. Um, and, um, uh, and we're uh, continuing to try to position our organization uh, with the best products, the best services, the best technology, so that they can uh, be successful in the marketplace. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Manav Patnik from Barclays. Please go ahead, Manav. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I just had one question. You know, earlier you talked about how you've been the most active in the M&A for uh, many years now. So I was just curious if you could just talk a little bit more about, you know, why now and perhaps what the pipeline in each of your segments looks like for future M&A. Uh, good morning, Manav. Um, yeah, as you know, M&A, um, uh, it's tough to predict. Um, uh, we think about it long term and, um, and make sure that we have relationships so that um, when uh, someone does decide that they want to transact, that we're, we're well positioned. Um, uh, so it's, it's really tough to predict um, uh, deal flow. Um, but again, we think about it long term and, we're, and we want to be, you know, we, we find um, M&A uh, really attractive. Uh, and, and, and in large part because of, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it, it gives us a, a new set of customers that we can offer uh, a wider breadth of, of products and services that we offer. There's really uh, can be highly attractive synergies. Uh, in many cases, we get um, um, uh, some um, uh, uh, infrastructure that is important to us, um, and we always get great people, and uh, and we learn from those. So. Yeah, we're highly interested in M&A of all shapes and sizes, uh, and um, and we're active in those markets. Tough to tough to pace it. Uh, it takes uh, takes two to dance, and uh, we just want to make sure we're we're at the dance and ready. Okay, fair enough. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And our next question comes from Scott Schneeberger from Oppenheimer. Please go ahead, Scott. Thanks. Uh, good morning, guys. Um, I, two. The first one is uh, just you know you've been speaking over the course of the year about investing in uh, your, your selling capabilities, technology, management training. Just an update there, and also you've been alluding a lot to my Cintas portal. Um, any quantification you can put on that about about penetration or anything else about how that's progressing? Thanks. Uh, yeah. Good morning, Scott. Um, it's tough to put a number on that. Um, it's kind of like. Um, uh, how do you put a value on the, the culture of CentOS? Um, you know, we're constantly reinvesting in uh, those technologies, uh, in, uh, in the, those trainings to position our people to be more successful. Uh, we talk about making it easier for them to do their jobs and make it easier for our customers to do business with us. So um, those are all investments that uh, are long-term thinking, long-term investments that positions our people to be successful in the marketplace. 
Um, some of those investments pay off faster, uh, but it's a continual investment. Um, and when we think about those investments, it is, you know, we have a, uh, an amazing team of partners that uh, are out at, uh, every day taking uh, great care of their customers. Uh, we want to make it easier for them. Uh, we want to make it, uh, you know, give them data that uh, allows them to uh, provide more value to the customers, uh, uh, make it um, uh, uh, less laborious for them to do their jobs uh, and, uh, and allow customers uh, the ability to self-serve uh, and have many conduits to, uh, to uh, uh, do business with CentOS and also communicate with CentOS. So all those um, investments are, um, uh, in, are, are ongoing uh, and will be, uh, frankly, uh, probably ongoing in perpetuity uh, because that's the, uh, the nature of business now, uh, that uh, technology plays a key role, and we're uh, blessed to have a balance sheet where we can uh, invest appropriately uh, and, and, uh, and position our team to be really successful. Thanks. Uh, and, and the follow-up is, uh, I just figure, fiscal year end and um, you know, all, all-time high in the fourth quarter on the operating margin. Um, so kind of a conceptual, longer-term question. You guys have done great since implementing the, implementing the ERP and, 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 and reaping benefits from it. What, what, what can you get to for peak margins? I mean, you've talked incre- about incremental margins, 25%, 35% range. Can you get to 25 promptly? Can you get to 30 longer term, um, just, just some consideration on what aspirational targets uh, would be reasonable. Thanks. Scott, uh, uh, I would say this. We don't like to put a ceiling on our, on our aspirations, but um, uh, we certainly think that we can continue to improve margins. And, and, uh, and so maybe a couple, couple points. First of all, uh, uh, 25 to 35 percent operating uh, incremental operating margins. Um, we've got locations that are operating uh, at the 30 plus level today, and and um, and so we and that's in all of our businesses. And so we there is a pathway there, and we are continuing to work on it. Some sometimes it's 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 better scale and density. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit of product mix. Sometimes it's the newness of the of the location. Um, but we have those examples, and we're continuing to get all of our locations closer and closer to those uh, highest operating uh, locations. Um, and and uh, that, that operating, uh, incremental operating margin range of 25 to 35, um, in our minds, tells us uh, certainly we can work, continue to work to get there. Um, as you go back to the, you know, you've talked a little bit about technology. Uh, I would say that uh, we're still in the early innings of technology. We've become much, much better at operating on the SAP system, um, and it's only been about four years since we've been since our rental business has been fully on, and Fire is not on yet. And and so we have been getting better and better at using that um, uh, system. But as you know, as, as we've talked about over the course of the last year or so. Uh, there are still a lot of things that can come with our Google uh, and Verizon and SAP partnerships that we are just touching the surface on, and uh, we think that um, uh, that can be a big driver of continued margin expansion into the future. Um, not ready to put a date on when we can hit 25 um, or 30, but uh, we certainly have that in our sights, and uh, we'll continue to work hard to get there. Thanks. Great job. And our next question comes from Shlomo Rosenbaum from Stifo Nicholas. Please go ahead, Shlomo. Hi, this is Adam for Shlomo. Uh, could you maybe provide a little bit of outlook for um, uniform direct sales and fire protection businesses for 25, and how much of a margin impact should there be on, in the fire business from the uh, SAP implementation you alluded to last quarter? Uh, from, from a fire uh, protection business uh, perspective, um, we're still in the implementation uh, phase of that, and, um, and that, there's going to be a little bit of pressure on, on there. I'm, I'm not going to give a specific uh, guidance in terms of their margin, but there'll, there'll, be, there'll be some pressure as we go through, uh, keeping in mind, when we go through an implementation, there, there is the work of the implementation, the work of training all of our people to use it, the inefficiencies that come along with that, and we will then get better and better. 
And uh, fiscal 25 is going to be a little bit of a year of, of that training and implementation period. Um, and so, so I, I would say um, uh, that's going to be a little bit of pressure on the margins there. Certainly that's incorporated within our overall guide of, of margin improvement. From a uh, uniform direct sale perspective, our margins have been really good. We've, we've, um, uh, we've been uh, working on uh, selling the right types of programs and, and our, our um, uniform direct sale partners are doing a great job in that area. Um, but uh, having said all of that, a little bit hard to tell based on that SAP implementation and FIRE, but, but keeping in mind that's included with our overall guide. Thank you. And our next question comes from Ashish Sabadra from RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead, Ashish. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, maybe just a question on the guidance philosophy, because uh, when we think about the organic growth in the quarter still continues to be pretty robust uh, compared to uh, the industry growth profile at seven and a half, but it has moderated uh, over the last eight quarters. The higher end of the guidance implies the 8% organic growth implies an inflection in growth. And historically, you've always set your guide where you have beaten and raised the guidance uh, throughout the year. Um, so as we think about where do we really see the inflection and in terms of guidance philosophy, would you say is it equally conservative as we have seen in the prior years? Thanks. Well, uh, I'll say uh, maybe this, um, uh, Ashish. Um, uh, you, you know, we had a we had an eight percent organic growth rate year this year, and uh, that was a really good year in a year where, uh, again, last year uh, we were at about twelve point two percent and ten percent the previous year, and these were years where there was just heavy inflation. And as, as you know, our pricing was uh, a little bit higher than norm. And we got the 8% uh, this year in sort of that uh, bringing the, the price increases back to uh, something closer to historical levels. Um, you know, as we think about um, uh, our, our, our guide, maybe I'll throw out a couple numbers to you. Um, and, and as Todd has been mentioning, we've, had a, um, we, we've not seen a lot of change in customer behavior, and we've had some really good performance in, 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 in our full fiscal 24 year, but uh, I'll point out a couple. In our third quarter, if you, if you adjust for the work days, our total growth was 8.2%. Um, in the fourth quarter, our total growth was 8.2%. In our, in our guide, uh, when you think about just simply the work day, our guide range is 6.7 to 8.3%. So, so our guide range is effectively um, telling you um, we're seeing this, the business operate in much of the same manner as we saw in the second half of the year. Uh, if you look at the organic numbers in, those, in the third quarter, fourth quarter, and next year, same story. And, and so the, the philosophy is a little bit of, look, um, we, we have to build a bit of a range because the, 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 we have to consider uh, certain alternatives, but, but effectively um, the, the guide range for fiscal 25 on the top line is right in line with what you've seen, particularly in the second half of, of fiscal 24, and that is really nice uh, 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 growth in all of our businesses, um, uh, certainly in, in uniform rental first aid and safety and fire protection. So um, hopefully that helps a little bit, Ashish. Yeah, no, that's very helpful, Color. Thank you. And our next question comes from Faiza Awi from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead, Faiza. Yes, hi, thank you so much. Um, so you mentioned earlier in the call about the white space opportunity and uh, you know just the attraction you're getting with non-programmers. I think relative to historical levels, the contribution from non-programmers to growth has been higher. So I'm curious if you can talk about you know, what you're doing differently. Are you maybe using technology? Has the pit changed a little bit? Is there something about the underlying environment? Uh, so just curious on you know, what's, what's driving sort of incremental um, contribution from non-programmers. Uh, I'll start, uh, but uh, and Mike, if you'd like to contribute. Uh, uh, Faisal, good morning, and I, um, 
you know, uh, for uh, several decades now, we have had a focus on uh, trying to grow the pie of the business, uh, and that white space um, is significant. So uh, we uh, uh, teach our, our organization about how to attract no programmers, um, and it's uh, it's a little different process, uh, and it takes uh, it's more of a conceptual uh, sale uh, versus uh, something. Um, uh, I'll call it more about, uh, well, you've got to coach them and teach them about um, uh, how to do something different um, instead of, uh, of, of uh, simply doing it yourself. Uh, and again, that's a conceptual uh, uh, sale, and we teach our folks on how to do that. And we happen to be uh, blessed with being in a, in a spot where there is a massive white space out there, um, and um, I, I'll say it's, it's a harder uh, concept to get across to people, uh, but we've been doing it for so long that it's uh, it's just part of uh, how our organization operates, and uh, and we think that um, uh, that's exciting for us. Uh, no real uh, obvious change I would point to. It's it's just part of our culture. It's part of how we teach and train our our uh, our partners on how to approach that, um, and it it resonates with people and. Um, um, because they, they get the concept of outsourcing, they get the concept of, uh, yeah, maybe uh, I am struggling to keep up with all this, uh, and you can do it, and you can do it better, faster, smarter, cheaper than I can, uh, and um, uh, that's been a, a, a key fundamental of how we've grown our business over the years and how we'll continue to grow our business uh, into the future. Liza, maybe I'll offer, maybe I'll offer this <clears throat> a bit. Um, think about the healthcare vertical that we've we've been in for maybe a decade or so uh, now. When we got into that, we needed to create uh, a sales team because it's just a different kind of sale, different kind of relationships. And so we had to create a, uh, a different kind of sales team. Uh, when, we, when, we, when we did that, uh, we started with sort of um, maintenance uniforms, uniform rental and maintenance. Uh, because we didn't have a, a, a broad product offering. <clears throat> As we continued in that business, we started to learn through dialogue with the customers how else we can help them. And we started things like microfiber. And uh, we started rental programs in microfiber. And that started to, to uh, take off and uh, has become a nice product for us. As we continued to have dialogue with them, we, that, that sort of evolved into then scrub uh, rental programs. Uh, these came out of, again, dialogue with how can we help our customers. And, and so this, this healthcare has grown from almost nothing to call it 8% of our revenue now. And it's, it's largely because of, of the adaptation of our people to this, this new type of vertical, along with our dialogue with our, our customers and creating a real nice partnership um, that then creates some innovation, that, that gets innovation flowing for us and new products and services. And then if we couple that with technology of, of having more information at our fingertips, of being able to uh, uh, find better prospecting as, as we can um, better uh, a, able to tell uh, what customers have which products and, and where might uh, the warmest leads and, and uh, so on be, we have over time, we have been able to grow the business and uh, through that grow our, the productivity. And so all of these things that we do that, that Todd talks about, they don't happen overnight. They are the evolution and continued dialogue and collaboration with our customers to become more and more ingrained in, in what we do with them. And, um, and so the, 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 you, you ask about the white space. This is just a continued evolution of the, that collaboration, innovation, technology wins, productivity improvement. That, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. And then just a quick follow-up on, on CapEx. You mentioned it at the outset as a priority. I know we saw an increase in, in CapEx in 2024. And apologies if I missed it. I don't know if you gave a specific number. But just talk a bit more about some of the CapEx investments and how, how we should think about that going forward. We we uh, we were about 4.3 percent uh, in fiscal 24 as a percent of revenue. Um, 
you might remember we, we had a little bit of catch up in truck purchasing through the year. We had some of the SAP uh, um, uh, investment uh, for fire protection. Um, we largely believe that, that CapEx in the future is, is the 35 to 4% of revenue range. I think that's where we'll likely uh, end up in fiscal 25. Great. Thank you so much. And our next question comes from Stephanie Moore from Jefferies. Please go ahead, Stephanie. Hi. Uh, good morning. Thank you. I wanted to follow up actually on just the last question there um, and just one quick question. Um, are you finding, you know, potentially some increased activity from new customers that are viewing maybe a, a value proposition differently? <clears throat> so taking, you know, maybe taking that another way with higher inflationary environment, maybe not looking to kind of do it in-house and kind of have that initial capital outlay and your value proposition is coming in. Is that um, has that been a contributing to contributing driver to the uh, to the growth? Uh, good morning, Stephanie. Uh, yeah, there's there's many inputs to it. Um, uh, certainly, if you are uh, in, with a rental uniform program, uh, if you want to buy garments, there's a there's a large capital outlay versus um, us doing that for the customer. Um, uh, in other areas where you might have to go buy dispensers uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, for chemicals or soaps, uh, uh, towels, what have you, in restrooms. Uh, and, uh, and we do that for the customer. Uh, we make that investment on their behalf. Um, uh, and then, again, we, we free them up to take care of uh, their business because they're on their, their, uh, their, their people, their, their customers, their guests, their patients. Um, so uh, I'm sure that contributes to it. Um, uh, certainly, when it's, um, uh, uh, I think we've benefited from, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, environment where uh, people are busy and they're, um, uh, you know, whether they're trying to hire people, take care of customers, um, and they say uh, uh, again, oh, wow, I didn't realize you could do that for uh, for me. Uh, you can do it at uh, those those uh, competitive rates. Uh, and that frees me up. And um, and over the years, we've we've spoken to many many customers who were surprised uh, that our average sized customer how small it is, um, and they didn't realize that they were big enough to have uh, a service like ours, uh, where um, you know our our average sized customer is really small, um, and that's part of our our uh, responsibilities to get the message out that we can help customers and our sales team out there actively pursuing those. But I've seen that over and over and again throughout the years. Great. Got it. No, that's, that's excellent color. Um, just um, last question for me. You talked, you talked about M&A being a bit more aggressive in this past year. Um, I'm curious what your appetite would be to maybe more aggressively expand in the fire and safety or fire and security space. You know, it's, a good, it's been a good vertical for you. I think it is an area or a market with a you know, pretty considerable white space. So just curious your appetite uh, within that vertical specifically. Thank you. Yeah, Stephanie, the, uh, the way I would describe it is, um, you know, uh, again, we, we were able to invest more in M&A this year than um, going back uh, all the way to 2000, uh, fiscal 17. Um, that being said, that, that is a, um, a byproduct of just um, timing, uh, deal flow, uh, when people make decisions. Uh, I wouldn't call it a, um, a, a change in strategy on our part. Uh, it was more about uh, timing and flow, uh, and that's tough to predict. As far as the first aid and safety business and the uh, fire business, um, we're acquisitive in every single uh, route-based business that we have. Uh, we we uh, and um, so we're uh, we like to uh, uh, evaluate um, every single deal and, uh, and make a good decision in the fire business specifically. Um, you know, uh, we want to make sure that we're we're uh, uh, competitive and fi and and, uh, and uh, uh, aggressive after good, attractive deals. Uh, the mix of business matters to us. Um, meaning, uh, you know, we like uh, a business that meets the mix of of, uh, of test and inspect that we have and repair along with that as well. Um, and uh, there are some deals that, uh, that have come across our desk that we have chosen not to participate in because there's a significant amount of installation in those businesses 
uh, and uh, the installation business tends to be kind of tied to new construction, uh, and um, that is um, a really uh, a varied business, uh, and uh, not one that's as attractive uh, to us. It's tougher to staff, tougher, it's kind of like bid and chase business, uh, so we've uh, chosen to avoid those. Um, but we are, uh, we really like uh, both the, uh, all the route-based businesses, again, we're highly acquisitive and, um, and would like to uh, continue on that path. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And at this time, there are no further questions. I'd like to turn the call back over to Jared for closing remarks. Thank you for joining us this morning. We will issue our first quarter of fiscal 25 financial results in September. We look forward to speaking with you again at that time. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.